Case number 114753, State of Kansas v. Victor Brosight. May it please the court. Good morning, your honors. My name is Kai Mann. I'm with the Appellate Defender's Office here on behalf of Mr. Victor Brosight. Just a quick, short, factual summary. On June 23, 2014, Officer Brandon Early received a call about a pickup driving erratically in Wellsburg, later located the pickup, pulled it over after he observed it cross the center line in which he identified Mr. Brosight as the driver. He got indications that Mr. Brosight may be driving while intoxicated, asked Mr. Brosight to perform field sobriety tests, which Mr. Brosight performed due to disabilities. Mr. Brosight also performed a preliminary breath test, was arrested, and also refused a breath test at the station as well, at which point Officer Early got a search warrant and proceeded to direct EMS to draw Mr. Brosight's blood and sent off to the KDI for analysis. And the police officer was present when the blood was drawn by the EMS tech? Yes, yes. Then on June 25, 2014, the state filed its first complaint alleging three different crimes Mr. Brosight committed. DUI pursuant to 1567A3, which does not involve a blood quantum analysis. It is intoxicated beyond the point of to be able to safely drive a vehicle. Also, driving while revoked as a bitch violator or in the alternative, driving while suspended and transported in an open container. This initial complaint listed five witnesses. It listed Officer Early, Deputy Hunter Dryden, who also helped Officer Early do the investigation in the field. And then it listed Franklin County dispatch personnel and KBI laboratory personnel. Now, the state did amend their complaint on July 1, 2014, this time adding the other two theories of DUI pursuant to 1567A1 and A2, both requiring blood quantum either before or after three hours. And they also replaced KBI lab personnel with Kayla Horst, the KBI chemist who analyzed Mr. Brosight's blood. However, Franklin County dispatch personnel remained on the complaint through the rest of the litigation. Mr. Brosight was arraigned on October 28, 2014. And then on April 29, 2015, the state files a motion to amend its complaint seeking to add the crime of the preliminary breath test refusal, which was discussed the day before or at trial in the jury room prior to jury selection in which the complaint was amended. However, the state at no time attempted to add Scott Harris, the EMS personnel who actually drew Mr. Brosight's blood, to the complaint or otherwise endorse him. So we get to trial after Officer Early or after Mr. Moyer, Officer Early, and Deputy Dryden testified, the state calls Scott Harris as a witness. Defense counsel objects on the basis of KSA 223201G, the subsection of the statute governing witness endorsement, and the district court overruled the request. And when raised on appeal, the Court of Appeals also denied this issue in which this court granted review, and which brings us to here today. What would have happened if the court would have sustained the objection and said, we're not going to let Ms. What's the remedy if they said not endorsed? Then he does not testify. Okay. And then what impact does it have on the case? I'm maybe jumping around here a little bit to harmless, but what impact does it have? No, I believe it does have an impact because, one, this would also allow and change defense counsel's examination of the KBI lab chemist. It could inject some more questions into the chain of custody. And furthermore, pursuant to KSA 8, I think it's 1001C, there are a very certain limited number of personnel who are actually allowed to draw this blood, which also could create an issue of, well, was the blood properly drawn? Or do we have any other alcohol sample mixed in from either 
you know, rubbing alcohol pad on is to take this blood? Or is there a problem with the blood draw itself to which this test shouldn't be reliable? But the police officer could testify to who took it and to the qualifications of the person who took it. He's standing right there, right? I believe he could testify as to who took it. I'm not sure if he could testify as to the qualifications. I think he could call, he, he could say, I did call the ambulance service and they sent over Mr. Harris, but I don't know if the police officer would have the personal knowledge to testify to Mr. Harris's qualifications. We don't know one way or the other how familiar they are. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, and I, and I understand, you know, it's a, it's a smaller county, but I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that would pass muster. At the very least, it would, it would give defense counsel an opportunity to, to argue that before the district court. However, where we get to the problem here is that KSA 223201G covers witness endorsement, and it has three sentences to the statute. And I contend that, this three sen that these three sentences have four separate parts. So the first sentence, Except as otherwise provided, the prosecuting attorney shall endorse the names of all witnesses known to the prosecuting attorney upon the complaint, information, and indictment at the time filing it. That presents the general rule. The prosecutors must endorse known witnesses on the charging do document. The second sentence provides an exception, stating, except as otherwise provided, the prosecuting attorney may endorse witnesses on its, or endorse on it names of other witnesses that may afterward become known to the prosecuting attorney at times that the court may by rule or otherwise prescribe. You find more witnesses after investigating your case, you may endorse those witnesses on the complaint, um, either by when the district court sets a deadline or by some other mechanism at which the district court chooses. Now, those two sentences have been basically the statute up until 1996. And in 1996, the third sentence was added to the statute, and I contend it, it should be read to, to provide two separate things. First, the first part of the, the third sentence says that the state can conceal a witness and not necessarily endorse them on the complaint if they have the fear that that witness is in danger of retaliation. And as read in the statutory language, if any witnesses to testify and the prosecuting attorney believes the witness who has provided information is in danger of intimidation or retaliation, the prosecuting attorney may delay identifying such informant witnesses until such informant witness actually testifies. Now, the last half of that sentence reinforces the general rule because it says, but in no event shall identification of a witness be delayed beyond arraignment without further order of the court after hearing and an opportunity of the defendant to be heard. I contend that the plain language of this subsect of this statute when read together simply states that prosecutors must endorse the names of all witnesses on the complaint unless two things are, are, are present. One, that they become otherwise known, afterward known, after they've already endorsed, or two, if you want to endorse anybody after arraignment, the defendant must have a hearing and an opportunity to object to, their, to object to that witness being endorsed and used. And if that has not been satisfied, it's simply too late by trial. We've uh, basically disagreed with your interpretation your, your, um, for over a century, really, mm -hmm. if, if you go back to the underpinnings of this. Uh, wouldn't there have been an opportunity for the legislature to change our interpretation if, if that was the our interpretation was that it does allow late endorse, endorsements absent some sort of prejudice. Well, I, 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 I do. Isn't that what we've done for a long time? And isn't that done really in, in a lot of cases in every courtroom across the state, there's late endorsement of witnesses that are known to the prosecution. What, what do we do with that? Well, I, I, I do know that this, that, that this, that this rule of late endorsement any time does go far back. In fact, the district court cited to a case from 1912, State v. Tassel, there are even one certain earlier. But what I believe is that after they added that third sentence in 1996, if you look to the, the opinions of this court even, State v. Vell in 2002, only cites the first two sentences of the statute. Same thing with State v. Bloom, uh, State v. Martins, and even uh, State v. Snow, those are 2002, 2002, 2002, so, 2006. So your argument is that the 1996 uh, amendment adding the third sentence effectively uh, changed our prior law. Yes. It was it, designed to correct. I, I'm not, I think one, it was designed to correct, and two, if it wasn't designed to correct, I believe that the, stat, that the, that the legislative history shows that the legislatures believed that witnesses were being endorsed timely, timely and that the general rule is still the rule. Now, I am just unsure as to what good having a rule requiring witnesses be endorsed before arraignment, unless you're gonna have a hearing, is if there's just no consequence for not having 
a witness endorsed. What would I don't understand what the purpose of 22-3201G would be if not to have witnesses endorsed as, pra as practical as possible. Again, when you go the second sentence, when it contains the exception, become afterward become known. To me, I think that should be a pre 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 condition precedent that the state must show before being allowed to endorse, uh, endorse a late witness is that I did not see or the value in this testimony, I did not know the identity of this witness, may I please endorse this witness. And even if a prosecutor can hold back the identity of a witness who is in danger of retaliation or intimidation, but even those people must be, cannot be delayed beyond arraignment without a hearing, then why should an EMS personnel who drew the blood and was available to all not be endorsed on, on the complaint? Because here, the state did allege a theory of DUI in which no blood quantum was needed. And at what point does, when especially when complaints are, or counts are alleged in the alternative, does the defense counsel get to try to predict what the state is trying to prove via the witnesses that have been called, the via the witnesses that have been provided to them, and build their trial strategy from there? Um, and and it's it's interesting uh, uh, when Justice Rosen spoke of harmlessness. It's interesting when you when we actually look to how this rule works in effect, is that there isn't doesn't appear to be a true harmlessness analysis to it. It seems uh, at this point. Um, if we look at uh, a Bell, for example, the test has always been abuse of discretion test, where, where the defense rights have been prejudiced, and it's up to defendant to show that prejudice. Instead of our traditional harmless error analysis, where we show error, and then it is upon the state as the party benefiting from the error and the late endorsement of witnesses to show that it's harmless. Right now, we have a situation to where it's not error, much less reversible error, unless the defense can show the actual prejudice and even if we get to the actual prejudice wrong, it's not reversible error because to be to, because for it to be reversible, opinions of this court has held that there has to be an objection, a request for a continuance, and the denial of that continuance, all due to the state not endorsing the witnesses as is their burden. So now we are in the middle of trial, and the defendant, who may have been suffering pretrial detention, has to now object, regardless of whether he knows the contents of the testimony, object and have that or object and request a continuance and have that continuance denied before the issue is even really preserved. Let's say we junk all that. Mm -hmm. We go to your perfect world mm -hmm. and we interpret the statute more along the lines of plain language. Um, what's the harm here? Why can't the state demonstrate harmlessness here? I, uh, one, I, one of the reasons when, when I looked through the Court of Appeals opinion and they listed like the four or five reasons as to why this was not harmless. Um, one, I think that just shows error. But two, I, in this case, I believe it would be harmless because as we spoke before, or it, it harm, wouldn't be able to show harm because the state would be unable to show that the blood draw was, was conducted according to statute with, with, with the correct personnel. It may also provide chain of custody issues regarding the blood and how it's transported um, and other further arguments based okay. on, on... I think it, I think it was objected to mainly on, on chain of custody and explain that to yes. me when the officers present sees the blood being drawn is handed the blood identifies the blood and has the emt sign the form that's admitted into evidence that it was properly done at least the emt signs the mm -hmm. form that that's what occurred right and then that then the then the the officer then transfers it to the kbi for testing where's where's the break in the chain of custody there? I, I think without it Perhaps chain of custody in this case is is, is not as strong, um, but one I know the officer was present. I would have to check the record to see if he actually witnessed the blood draw. I, I, he signed, I, yeah, I believe I he did. He said um, he did. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But also at the same time, I think we get into the other issues of who is allowed to collect these blood draws, procedures of following these blood draws to make sure there's no contamination, no other cross contamination, no other problems with the blood draws, no other chemicals get mixed in either from Mr. Brosette's skin or or anything else. So rather than a chain of custody, you're really a foundational kind of... Yes, and, and also to undermine the testimony of the KBI lab personnel who had yet to testify at trial. How? Explain that. How, did it, how would it have undercut? Because then during cross-examination, defense counsel could ask what procedures must be followed to make sure that a sample is accurate and not otherwise tainted, and what the possibilities of that otherwise being tainted if you have an untrained professional drawing blood from an individual. Does the record here reflect all of those things were pursued with the witness? Well, it does not because 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 Scott 
Harris was endorsed and allowed to testify. Right, but mm -hmm. but was Mr. Harris asked those questions? Uh, I do not believe so. I believe he was just simply asked. I, I believe he was asked the procedure of how to draw the blood and what was done uh, in, in that regard. But I don't believe, I don't even believe defense counsel even cross-examined Mr. Harris. Um, but again, I would have to check. To but we're supposed, sure to, I'm not sure I'm following. They were supposed to assume then that had that opportunity not been present, there would have been harm. I, I mean, when the evidence is that, when the, when the transcript shows that none of those issues were pursued here. It, it, I understand, but I think really the larger problem is that even though the state is benefiting from the error of having this witness in, it is up to Mr. Brosite to demonstrate what the harm is as opposed to being able to identify error and the state bearing the burden of harmlessness. Now, I understand that this may be a case where there may or may not be harm, but given the current standard of review and the current preservation issues, we don't even get to those questions as to whether or not this was harmless, even though the statute provides a system for endorsing witnesses that should be followed and is stated in the plain language. Your, your client was charged in the, in the alternative under two different theories. The jury was instructed on two different yes. theories, one on the, the blood draw and the 0.08 or greater and the other incapable of safely operating mm -hmm. a motor vehicle. The jury signed verdict forms um, finding a unanimous verdict finding both alternatives, as I understand it. Yes. Okay, that, that's, that's your understanding. So how, so even if you get to the 0.08 or greater blood draw uh, objection, what about the, the alternative conviction that was found unanimously by the jury that he was incapable of safely operating a motor vehicle? And there's lots of evidence that would support that. His swerving in the lane, the, the, what led to the stop, his behavior on the stop on the video is pretty drunken behavior. Um, and then all the other accompanying testimony about his conduct at the, at the scene. I mean, is, isn't there just abundant evidence about his intoxication and his incapable of safely operating the vehicle? Uh, may I answer in two yeah, parts? Sure. Uh, first, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure if there was much evidence of Mr. Brosite in unsafely operating vehicle. Officer Early testified that he, he didn't, didn't maintain a single lane. That's pretty... I, there, there are no main lane markings on this road. He was driving in a, in a very small rural area with no line. I did not, when I observed the video, I did not view it to be that way. And Officer Early also testified that he did not think he was driving, or, you know, driving unsafely. Uh, and secondly, I think that once the evidence comes in of what the blood alcohol content is, that necessarily in the jury's mind will inform the question as to whether or not you're safe or not because it very few laws that m many Kansans know but I'm guessing that one is is that if you're over 0.08 you're drunk but and even, I, even though that that alternative doesn't consider the blood alcohol level but what I'm saying is that when as, when testimony is presented on that blood alcohol level even if the jury isn't considering it expressly under the first alternative, that evidence is going to inform how they view the rest of the evidence and, and is going to make that determination more likely. Uh, we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank May it please the court, Stephen Hunting, Franklin County Attorney, appearing on behalf of the state of Kansas. Why don't you start us off with what is the purpose of 223201G and can the state just ignore it? The state cannot just ignore it, Justice. Well, what's, what's the purpose of it? The purpose is fairness. The purpose is so that the defense, the defendant specifically, has an idea of what evidence through witnesses will be presented against him at trial, as well as who will be testifying to present that evidence. In this and, particular... and the witnesses that are known to the prosecuting attorney. Correct. Mr. Harris was known to the prosecuting attorney from the outset of this case. He was known uh, at some point early on in terms of probably likely after the first charging decision when the remaining discovery came in concerning the blood draw evidence that he himself conducted. And the state would concede the prosecutor made a mistake in not getting the witness endorsed sooner. I would concede that to this court. 
Well, that, the widow was, was really never endorsed. That is correct. I mean, you, you, you amended it three times, and then you amended it right before trial, and, and Mr. Harris still is not a part of the, uh, the, uh, the witness list that's to be called, and you wait until trial. I mean, how, what, what is the purpose of the statute if that is allowed to happen? Well, in this particular case, and I go back to it is about fairness, and what is important to note that this matter, in accordance with the statute, it was litigated before the district court. The defendant was afforded a hearing. These things were brought up before the court. And it is important to note that the defendant himself conceded, I was aware of Mr. Harris. I was aware of the information surrounding Mr. Harris. And where, where, we are where, not where, prejudiced. Where, where, do you, where, where is this about fairness? Isn't this just about a requirement? Well, I believe that the requirement is grounded in fairness. And in this particular case, the defense conceded they were not prejudiced by this. They were not surprised by this. And when reading the statute, there's nothing in the statute, when you look at the plain reading of the statute, that puts a time limit on this. That's why we have the long-standing test that we do in terms of if this is granted, will the defendant suffer actual prejudice? In this case, he conceded automatically he would not, in this particular case, suffer any prejudice whatsoever. And there, the conversation, in many respects, stops. That happened, just so I can get the timeline right, that happened prior to his testimony? It's my understanding of the record that the witness was called, but prior to him taking the stand, defense lodged an objection. Right. And then the matter was litigated outside of the presence of the jury. So just the way this happened in the courtroom is the jury was excused, and then the parties were permitted to present their arguments as to whether this witness would testify. And then the judge made a ruling. That is correct, yes. And during those arguments, the defense conceded there's no actual prejudice here. Uh, we were familiar with Mr. Harris through the discovery. We were familiar with Mr. Harris 